Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is your host, Gabe Ar-Romani, and we are talking once again about the ideal Muslim family. Now, we are not telling you, brothers and sisters, that we're going to solve your problem in this show on Peace TV here, that this is going to be, you know, that's it. This is your final stop. We're telling you that you are the one who can solve your problems. But there are a few things that we can recommend to you. And this is not our opinion. This is what, bidnillah, we're trying to get from the Prophet ﷺ, from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to him. And alhamdulillah, I'm joined again today by my dear respected brothers and teachers, Sheikh Salim Amri, Sheikh Hassan al Hakim, and Dr. Ahmed Sifuddin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear Mashaykh, we are talking about a very important topic. This is something, if we could put it on a scale of importance, and it's probably one of the most important. And as we said in our previous shows, that the Muslim family is the building unit of society. And I want us to talk a little bit, if we can, about the importance of the Muslim family for the whole world, for both Muslims and non-Muslims, right? Because we don't want people to think that we're just talking about, okay, Muslim families within, you know, Muslim countries and that's it. We are ignorant of the rest of the world. What is the importance of the healthy Muslim family for the whole world, for the global village? And if we want to start, inshallah, with Nila with Sheikh Hassan. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa tadabihi wa dahu amma ba'd. Probably some of us would think that this is a bit of an offshoot. It's an exaggeration. Hmm. What would a family in Dhaka or in uh, Vancouver or in Beijing, a Muslim family, do to affect the whole world? Well, actually, right. a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. And never look down at yourself and your potentials. However, when we want to change and solve our problems, it is not us that do this. We have to do it with Allah's grace and, and help. So mm -hmm. just uh, yeah, I need to put this in perspective, right. we do not change anything. We are not able to do anything without Allah's help. Now, if you look at the Muslim family, a Muslim family is, as you've stated, it's, it's a brick in the whole wall of mm -hmm. humanity and of the society. And if this brick is not there, the wall will collapse. Not only that, it can make it or break it in the sense that if you have a good, reliable Muslim family, this would add value to humanity. In all aspects, being a family that is green, not related to Sheikh Abdurrahim Green, definitely, but <laughs> I'm talking about being green in the sense that if we raise our children not to abuse the usages of plastics, right. of littering, of pollution, imagine the impact the Muslims, which are considered to be like, what, one third of the population of Earth? Mm. This would add a lot of value to the whole of the humanity. If we fail to bring our children to understand Islam and to know what Islam truly is, if we fail in doing this and end up having them radicalized mm. or blowing themselves up mm. or abusing those who are from a different race or ethnicity, yeah. arrogance would fill their hearts, ignorance would fill their minds. This is the role of the Muslim family. So in essence, I think that when we manage to seek Allah's guidance in making a Muslim family, this has a very positive impact on the society at large. For the whole of humanity. This reminds me of something, so I'm not sure the authenticity of the hadith, but the meaning, and it's quite authentic, I would say, is that the Muslim is like the rain, right? Wherever he falls and he brings benefit. This is authentic. Right. So, I mean, subhanAllah, Muslims, non-Muslims, as you talked about the environment, right? Because people are like, what does the family have to do with the environment? But it starts from there, from basic education about recycling or about not harming the environment, polluting it, and so on. It will leave its impact. And especially if every family is in sync. Correct. And if I'm not mistaken, Islam teaches us 
to take care of this and also to be in sync, subhanAllah. And this is something very important. So without a doubt, the Muslim family has effect on society at large. And subhanAllah, we live in a global community. You know, Bob and John and Stacy can benefit from Ahmed and Muhammad and Abdullah. You know, they're Muslim neighbors who are, you know, a good family, a good Muslim family. And that can bring numerous benefits. But this goes both ways. Right? It goes both ways, no doubt. Yeah. So even Bob and Tracy can benefit the Ummah if they abide by Allah's laws. No. And they can harm the whole of humanity, humanity if, if they, they do don't. Not. And the Muslim family, likewise, if they don't abide by the Quran, we become monstrous. No. We become the worst ever to live on earth because we have nothing to hold us back. No. This is the beauty of Islam once implemented. Sheikh Salam, in a previous episode, we talked about the husband and the wife. I mean, this is the first, you know, base of the family, right? And right now you said that, you know, we gave the example of Bob and Stacy, right? If they themselves do not abide by the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope they don't sue us, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Bob and Stacy are trade names, inshallah. Okay. <laughs> but in Islam, the issue of nasab is very important, lineage, right? And this seems what one of the keys of our Muslim family, or not just the family, the family at large, is this issue of people not respecting lineage. And it happens at the husband and wife, or partner, let's say, a level, right? How does that impact the family and the Muslim family at large, any people not respecting these boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised? Because in the end of the day, the family starts with the husband and the wife. Exactly. I'll come back to this point. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the topic is so vast. It's very vast, actually. Yeah. And we are talking about the Muslim family. Okay. And we need that Muslim family. We need the Muslim family that has the rida, the contentment. Okay. That they are content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them. The Muslim family that they are role model. Okay. So that non-Muslim neighbors this Muslim family, wow. wow, okay, we want to be like them. See, they are so mannered, the children, so disciplined, okay? The Islam, really, in many places of the world, only traders, merchants went there. But when the people saw the character, the Islamic character, they became Muslims. Uh -huh. So in Islam, then when the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Wallahi la yu'min, Wallahi la yu'min, Wallahi la yu'min, man bata wa jaruhu ja'i'un, wa huwa ya'lam. He's not a believer, he's not a believer, he's not a believer. Whoever sleeps while knowing his neighbor is hungry. Is hungry. This is our Islam. The Sorry Prophet, to cut you, but how would he know that he's hungry? He should... See, you know, the person... Okay, his income, okay, you know, he hardly, what he gets mm. can provide him three meals a day. Or maybe he reaches, mm. he knew about it from different means. I would say that also it requires some effort from our you should ask. side to ask should to go ask. and know that, about them. Exactly, that's Allah. part, part of the right of the neighbor. Allah. When the Prophet's wives would make a, a prof soup. We say increase the, water increase the water so that we can give it to as many neighbors as oh, Akbar. Abdullah ibn Umar in Adab al-Mufrad. This is the beauty of Islam. We want to share it with you. Mm. We have a lot of things in Islam we can give and share. His neighbor was a Jew and they slaughtered a goat. He said, never forget my neighbor. Give him part of that. The Prophet in one of his hadith, he said, if you bring gifts for your children, you bring gifts for the children of your neighbor. Allah. Otherwise, don't let your children to come out playing with their toys. Sure. SubhanAllah. This is what we want to share with the people. Mm. So imagine that those brothers and sisters, Muslims, families, whether in the West, wherever they are, they are role models and they are true Muslim families. That is da'wah. Mm. Have you called your neighbors for a meal? Yes, for a meal. Yeah, he's not a Muslim, yes, but he is my neighbor. Mm. The point was about the husband and the wife. Mm. 
and not respecting, as Sheikh Asim was saying, you know, that even non-Muslims should abide by the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we identify this as one of the reasons for the decay of the Muslim family is that the relationship between man and woman and not respecting the boundaries of Allah, this influences the family, yani, right? Because you see, when, as Muslims, it's not utopian, right? Okay? There will be ups and downs in the marital life, and Prophet Muhammad's life is an example, okay? And we all know the famous story that he left his wives for one month. So it's not idealistic, okay? But there is a reference we refer to it, mm. okay? We don't cross that border, which is what Allah said, what the Prophet no. said. So the word ideal and is relative, right? We're not talking ideas perfect. And this is something very important that I wanted to bring up, that a lot of people will give up and they'll look for other avenues to improve their family lives because they say, well, you know, Islam is just so, you know, idealistic or something, or they say they think that it has to be perfect. And as you said, the Prophet ﷺ had problems with his wife, oh, Sani. You know, and the first problem husband and wife have, they think, ah, you know, this is, I'm done with this, you know, I cannot work with this, it's too hard. See, Akhi, Imam Nasa'i, and this is a beautiful book, Ishrat al-Nisa, how you deal with women. He said one of the Sahaba had a problem with his wife. Mm. And he was fed up. Mm. So he, he was looking for help. So he went to Sayyidina Umar. From outside, he heard Umar's wife screaming. Right. So he said, hey, I'm not alone. Huh? <laughs> I'm not alone. This is happening in Umar's house. He turned back. So he turned back. But then Sayyidina Umar opened the door. Uh, come, brother, come. Uh, nothing, nothing. No, no, come back. And he told him, he said, listen, Akhi. See how Sayyidina Umar reacted. And he started listing her activities. So, um, he said, he cooks for me. He stitches my clothes. He looks after my children. He cleans the house. Listing. If she flares up from time to time, I have to take it. Life is about give and take. It's funny. It's such an important That is point. A very important. We should not be idealistic. He gets angry. Sayyidina Ali, who is better than Fatima radiallahu anha? Sayyidat Nisa ahlil jannah. The lady of all the women in the Jannah. And yet he made Sayyidina Ali angry mm. one day. And the Prophet Sallallahu came oh, and said, where is your husband? He said he left. Oh, Allah. And he was angry. Allah. He knew where to find him. He went to the masjid. And Sayyidina Ali slept in the masjid and he woke him up and he gave him the kunya Abu Turab. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. We're going to take a little break. Zakullah khair, mashallah. We'll be right back in a few minutes on Peace TV. This is your host, Gabriel Romani.